Welcome to the Schmidt House Podcast. I'm your host, Zach. And on today's episode, I'm going to kick off my Harry Potter series. In this series, I'm going to have seven episodes going over each one of the books and movies. And down the line, eventually get to some of the video games and overall rankings as well. I plan on doing one of these episodes each month. So today, I'm going to start off with book number one, The Philosopher's Stone. Harry Potter is possibly my favorite fandom. It captured my mind as a kid, and I was constantly reading it. I don't even know how many times I have read this book specifically. Um, I also remember watching uh, this movie specifically pretty much every single day on VHS when it came out. I think one thing that attracted me, especially when I was younger, was that it was a realistic world that you could live in. I loved superheroes and Middle Earth and all that when I was young, but Harry Potter was set in our world and it just fits so well and uh, it always just really excited me. I, like probably so many others, was constantly waiting for my Hogwarts letter. Uh, Unfortunately, it never came, but here we are. There are certain things that uh, I'm excited to share with my kids, such as Star Wars episodes one through six and the MCU, But nothing excites me more than sharing the world of Harry Potter with them. I have a couple of things in mind that I plan to do with them just to kind of like get that hype going and uh, get that excitement for the series. So I'm going to get this out of the way as well. Um, On in this series, I will not be talking about Fantastic Beasts or The Cursed Child. Those are just badly written fan fiction, if we're being honest, and uh, I certainly don't consider them canon, and I don't think they should be. But uh, this time, instead of reading the paper copies like I have so many times before, I listen to them on audiobook. It just fit better for me time-wise. Rather than having to dedicate time to read, I could listen to them in the background, especially because I've read them so many times. You know, I could almost recite the Philosopher's Stone to you, but... um, Yeah, I've listened to the audiobooks before, and they're really good. Um, I've listened to the audiobooks and read the books at the same time and just really get into it. Um, But uh, I found a really good site to listen to them on. I have it linked in the description box. It has both versions of the readings done by both um, Stephen Fry and Jim Dale. Both versions are good. I'll have to uh, say that I like that um, Stephen Fry's version a little bit better than Jim Dale's. but, um, But yeah... Check that out if you uh, want to kind of do a little read-along as I go through these. I'm going to start off by talking about the book. So here's some good things and some things that I liked about the book. The way that this book is written, having each chapter being almost a mini story amongst the overarching um, plot of the book, it reminds me lots of reading The Hobbit as well. At least the mini story structure of it and those little arcs. Um, where we're introduced to something new in each chapter. And for the most part, each chapter does have a mini resolution into them. At least that's the way c- that I saw it. Um, just because th- there's not a lot of chapters and it's a, it's a relatively short book in comparison to the other ones. But it is just really compact and you know, um, have a mini adventure in each thing. So that's kind of cool. And I think that would really be attractive to a, a young reader. Um, so I think that's something that this book and a little bit into the second book has that t- same kind of structure, uh, you know, within each chapter. I, I also have the, the first edition of the book, which included a, an error in the shopping list. There's a couple of other errors, but this one always stood out is they had the wand listed twice. And so I thought that was really unique. Um, the whole world of Harry Potter is also something that um, obviously I've talked about this before but you you can get really involved in it and that's something that I like and there's certain things uh and aspects of the wizarding world that is translated right over into real world and one of those is a word that uh, she came up with which is absolutely genius is muggles it works so well in the book and is integrated into common tongue common tongue it's it's really cool um but jk is uh she's very good with her descriptions and she's being able to give such good descriptions of things and it makes it really easy to envision the characters and the setting and what everything would look like and how this person would talk and behave um she's really good at descriptions with that um particularly around characters 
I think this is a great book for younger readers. It'll give uh, them an easy introduction, not to just the, the story of Harry Potter, but reading in general. And I certainly uh, wouldn't have been nearly engaged in reading uh, as a whole had it not been for this series. So this is a great entry for, for that reason. You're not getting into really complex themes or something that an ele- a 10, or 11 year old, or maybe even younger won't really be able to understand. So that's a really big positive of this book. Every time I reread this book, I do wish it was longer as I feel there's a bit more story to be flushed out. It would be interesting to see how JK would have maybe rewritten things or um, just given the way that the rest of the series played out. Maybe there's some certain other things that she would have wanted to involve or put a character in earlier on um, and had them interact, even though they might not become a more main character later on in the books. It just would be interesting to see. Um, one other thing that uh, JK absolutely nails in this book is the feeling of being an orphan and what that must feel like to have your parents die as a child and, and grow up being raised by other people. This re- comes through really strong, especially in the Mirror of Erised chapter, which, in my opinion, is probably one of the best chapters in the entire series because it's, it's really isolated and it's a, it's a simple story but provides so much character development. Um, if it's not the be- one of the better ones in the series, it's for sure the, the best one, in my opinion, in this book. It really stands out that way. And now for a couple of things that I didn't like about the book. So I said before of how um, good she was with describing things and painting that picture, which I, I will say she's good at. But one thing that she lacked was uh, the ability to world build or at least an overall direction when comparison when in comparison to Tolkien or Martin. These authors wrote the world uh, for the characters to live in while JK wrote the characters and then worked the world in after. And it kind of shows a little bit um, in this book after you read it and after you kind of see how it all plays out because in her writing that's riddled with little potholes and almost retcons that in my mind I would say that there's no way that she would have known that's the direction that she wanted to go down the road or had this fully planned out um, she was trying to maybe shoehorn some things in or, or whatnot but one good example of this is the fact that the best way for in this book particular, the best way for Harry to actually get to London is instead of going with the Dursleys would have been to go on, on uh, to take the night bus to get to the Hogwarts Express and, and platform nine and three quarters. But she didn't come up with that idea until later. Um, I think if she would have had maybe, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not citing her for this, but it had a little bit more time to plan out things and just think a little bit more about the world that she was trying to create um, rather than come up with these characters in the story and then try to fit fit in the world around it. And I think there's a little bit more evidence of this uh, in the seventh book where she does shoehorn things um, that she set up in this book. Um, there's also a little simple plot conveniences like the snitch or the put outer that um, in the seventh book, in my mind, never really made sense. It was just conveniently a way to work something in that she put in the first book. Um, so I, I don't know. I think having maybe a little bit more of a world to build and to draw from probably could have made that those transitions or maybe even little things like this that she did install in the first book play out a little bit stronger. Um, I think she had just like had she thought about a few more key details, even like ha- the house point system, it would have aided long term throughout the other books as well. And you can tell that this book was made for kids and the series direction ended up not being that way. The series direction is largely focused on on death. And uh, that doesn't shine through in in the first one. But again, I, I'm not nitpicking. I don't think that she um, I don't think she really expected to have the world be what it is and and for Harry Potter to actually take off. Um, but she was very imaginative and tried to make the, the Wizarding World, specifically in this book, seem was really outlandish. For examples of this would be like the monetary system or Quidditch. Um, I think this book is also maybe just a little bit too short to flesh out the overall direction. And again, in fairness to J.K. Rowling, um, she never envisioned Harry Potter would be what it would be when she was writing these first books. 
and being able to sit here with hindsight, it's basically my largest nitpick. But again, um, but this next gripe is going to be one continuous one that I have within this series, and that's um, one over hyping and under delivering on Quidditch. Um, I know in interviews she said that she had a really difficult time writing Quidditch, um, and in lots of the books she just omits it, which is annoying, uh, not just for uh, the story centered around Harry, but the other teams as well. Um, you don't really see, you don't really ever have any aspects of them going to watch the games. It's just as, oh, Slytherin beat Ravenclaw and that's it. So Quidditch is extremely underdeveloped. Um, so th that's kind of one thing that bothers me throughout this series. But um, the last two chapters in this book particularly are ba bad due to plot holes and oversights. It works well if you're not young and, and um, you're not having to think that much about it, I guess, would be the best way to, for lack of a better term, but like overthink it or like, why does this make sense? Why doesn't this make sense type thing? But when you're reading it as an adult, I'm sure you're thinking that like lots of the stiff stuff just doesn't make sense. Um, structurally, the challenges that the trio needs to go through uh, shows their strengths well. Harry's problem solving and being good at flying, Hermione's intelligence and logic, Ron's skills with wizard chest, um, you know, but the mirror is pretty much the best defense for protecting the stone. And Dumbledore could have just kept the mirror in his office or in the room of requirement or where it was at uh, during the Mirror of Error said chapter. And Quirrell honestly never would have got to it. Um, plus, Dumbledore didn't need any of the other teachers to set up safeguards as he's if he is as powerful as everybody says. Um, he didn't need any of the t other teachers help. So. Um, that just doesn't quite make sense, but there, I have read this, um, really good fan theory that all of these oversights and, you know, maybe things that weren't as well thought of, uh, thought out of, um, were really just ways of Dumbledore to be able to challenge the trio so that they could learn skills, uh, that they would need for the future fights. Um, and that Dumbledore has, plan throughout all seven books to actually play out and train Harry and each thing that we might see as an ignorance is actually um, strategic in ways to prep the trio and, and Harry specifically, the people that he has to interact with, um, why he brings certain people to the school and stuff like that um, is all really important for the over the you know Dumbledore's big plan and stuff so it is an interesting theory I just it's tough to make all of those assumptions line up in my opinion but um one other thing too about this book is we're just supposed to ignore that Harry an 11 year old kid killed one of his teachers in his first year at this magical school and nobody really cares about it at all and it also kind of like in in this book in this book, if Voldemort comes back and is in possession, uh, possess, possesses a, a teacher, in the second book, he possesses a girl, third book, nothing, fourth book, he actually comes back, why doesn't anybody believe it? It's like the, these things have been happening kind of uncoincidentally, and we're just, and everybody in the wizarding world is ignoring that he's back, even though it's mentioned multiple times in the first book that everyone is suspecting that he'll eventually come back. Like, it just doesn't make sense that um, Cornelius Fudge and the, and the Ministry of Magic and lots of people within the wizarding world just completely ignores the fact that um, Voldemort could be back, even though in the very first entry of this series, um, he is essentially possessing people. So it's just weird. I, I It just doesn't fit in my mind. Um, I think that, uh, JK Rowling also had less strength when writing younger characters. Uh, lots of the stuff in this book seems way too advanced for the capability of that of an 11 year old. I remember when I was 11 and, you know, I wouldn't have been able to put lots of this stuff together, um, and act in, in lots of the ways that, uh, that Harry does. I, I feel specifically in the first three books they are playing up to, you know, uh, greater than their age actually is. So that just kind of doesn't fit for me. But down the road, JK definitely is um, 
way better at writing those characters uh, as more age appropriate, I would say. But just for what 11 year olds are able to piece together in this book and the responsibility that they kind of take upon themselves, it just it doesn't fit for an 11 year olds. 11 year olds aren't very smart. No offense. But um, yeah. One other thing too, before we kind of move on to the movies, but it's always kind of annoyed me is Dumbledore just goes full Oprah at the end of the book and gives away house points and just sort of basically rob the house club house cup from Slytherin. I think it's a little bit ridiculous. Uh, I would be pretty upset as a Slytherin to see it stolen in that way. So um, that's kind of, I think that's pretty much it from the book. Um, if there's anything else, I'll mention it later, but we're going to move on to the movies. So some things that I liked about the movie, um, the way that they were able to construct the world and the castle with such accuracy and richness, it, it honestly felt real. You add in the score from John Williams, um, his magical music. Uh, you know, I could listen to that score anytime. It it stands out. Um, it stands out the most as far as aspects of the um, the movie itself. The music just gives it such a good footing, and it sets it up for for the rest of the series. To you hear Hedwig's themes and a theme, and you know the you can just you can hear basically. The, the little notes of the intro to Harry Potter, you know exactly what it is. And they tried to have tried to mimic that for pretty much everything surrounding the wizarding world. When you hear those notes of John Williams score it, you know exactly what's coming soon, right? You're going to see Harry Potter logo flash up. So um, that is that ability um, props to John Williams. He's one of my favorite composers. I've, I've loved so many of his scores, whether it is, um, Star Wars or Hook or Indiana Jones, like all of those, they're all incredible. But this one stands out the most. And I listen to it very frequently, no matter what I'm doing. But the casting in this, uh, the series as a whole is really good. And it all kicked off with this movie, obviously. I do prefer Michael Gambon as Dumbledore more so than uh, Richard Harris, but he still fits really well as Dumbledore. There's really not anyone that I would change, to be completely honest, even through the rest of the, the movies as well. Uh, there's so many castings that they absolutely nailed. They're so perfect. I think the main two that stand out in my mind are Robbie Coltrane as Hagrid and Alan Rickman as Snape. I don't think anyone commands a scene as well as Alan Rickman does in any of the movies. And honestly, Snape is the, the best actor um of anyone in in this series I'll, I'll put i'll rubber stamp that one the cinematography was also really well done for the first in the series um it set a pretty high bar you know you look at things like the way that they shot hagrid to make him appear bigger and um from different angles lots of the time uh, the camera set really low and looking up on an angle at, at him um to kind of give you a perspective of how big he is from from harry's point of view which which is really done really well done um, I do wish that they made him a bit larger just to match uh, the books a little bit more. Um, I think they have him set at just over eight feet, and in the books he's, uh, I think, over ten. So that does just kind of pet peeve me as a, a little bit of a perfectionist myself. I would try to make things as, as close to the book as possible. Uh, the CGI for this movie was really, really good, um, and it still holds up pretty well. Even though it was made in, uh, it, it, you know, it came out in 2001, so it's a little bit dated, but lots of it does still um, hold up pretty well. Um, scene like, scenes like uh, Diagon Alley and Hogwarts really made uh, it feel like a lived-in world. So you, the t attention to detail and stuff like that that they put into the props and, and all of that was just really well done. Um, and being able to see it, it makes you, it, like, feels like it's ripped from the inside of my imagination. Um, you know, so the, f so the fact that they would be able to put something like that together really showcases the strength of the production crew, uh, that they're able to have, you know, when you talk to, when people talk about Harry Potter, they say how accurate it was towards, w you know, what they're envisioning when they're reading the books, uh, w which is really exciting to see, you know, it, it, if they were to not, connect with that i think the strength of the series as a whole really would have failed if they would have screwed something up um drastically but they did an overall good job especially for 
having nothing to build, build on and having to be able to come up with everything, um, you know, for this fil- first film. You know, even scenes like watching Harry walk by the Nimbus 2000 and look at it in the window, uh, the expression on his face was probably exactly how I looked while watching that scene in theaters. Um, I was, Flying on a broom was one of the coolest things um, when I was young. It, it was always something that I thought was like one of the pinnacle things. Having a wand and a broom, uh, everything else is kind of secondary at that point. But uh, in the books, they also wear regular clothes under their cloaks. I think the addition of a uniform was a significantly better look. Um, and this held true more so for the first two movies. And I wish they would have kept the school uniforms on uh, as an aesthetic, as an aesthetic throughout the entire series. They kind of um, ditch it uh, starting on the third one. Um, lots of the time when they're not in classes, they wear street clothes. And I just think it fits more in the world if they're actually wearing robes all the time. But there again, we've, if we go back to the attention to detail being so good, Ron's robes um, are a bit discolor- discolored, showing that he got hand-me-downs because his family can't afford nude ones. Like little things like that just really stand out. Uh, same with the castle. It does feel a lot more authentic in the first two films in comparison to the later ones. And I think uh, that's because they shot lots of the scenes on location more so than on a soundstage. And it really shows, um, especially when, you know, they're walking around the courtyards and stuff like that. It feels like a real place. Um, But we're going to move on to a couple of the uh, things that uh, I didn't like as much about the film. So there's a couple small changes that I feel that uh, didn't necessarily need to be changed. Uh, something like uh, Petunia and Dudley's hair color having changed from blonde to black. Uh, same with Neville Longbottom. His hair is described as blonde in the books. Um, this is more of a, a general pet peeve, not specifically about anything, but the, having to change the name to the Sorcerer's Stone uh, just due to the American audience, I think, is a really silly oversight. Having two titles just doesn't really make sense, and that's the same goes for the book and the movie. But their excuse, because they didn't think Americans were smart enough to know that a Philosopher's Stone title would have uh, had a relationship to the magical world and that people wouldn't want to read a book with philosophy in the title, uh, it's just kind of silly. And also the fact that the, the Dursley's hair color being changed um, to match Harry's hair color, um, they assume that people wouldn't think that they're actually related Um, so I just, I, I think that it's kind of just a little bit unnecessary, but, um, as far as the movie goes though, uh, the child acting isn't the best, but I, you truly can't fault them for that when you're dealing with that many little kids, um, you know, 10, 11, 12 year olds as your main cast. And, uh, you know, you don't usually get the exposure to the level of, um, training and, um, acting ability and talent that way. So you can't really complain about that all that much. And it does get better later on this in the series. I think of the kids, Tom Felton as Draco Malfoy is probably the best actor of the bunch. I also think that there was a missed opportunity by cutting the Norbert and Charlie Weasley scene. Charlie's omission from the movies was something that always annoyed me. He was one of my, I always liked Ron's older brothers, Bill and Charlie and in the books, they're really cool. Um, Bill is in the movies a little bit, and Charlie is mentioned, I think, a couple times in this movie, and I think pretty much ignored um, from there on out. Um, and I think the the whole series kind of suffered from little things like this um, in just having to trim some of the story down to fit a movie format. Um, I'm personally someone that likes long movies, so I would rather them include more than less. I, you know, I do pretty much exclusively if I watch the Lord of the Rings, watch the extended edition, um, because I th- I'd rather have a fully fleshed out story than have little gaps that, you know, it makes sense to a movie goer, but for someone that's read the books and is into, you know, the lore and the, you know, the whole overarching story and, and, the, and the world that they've built up, I do like to see longer movies. So I would rather sit through, you know, a three and a half hour movie, and have everything flushed out rather than them cutting it down to a two hour movie and then me missing out on some things that I do like. So, um, I think the first five chapters of the book 
feel rushed when it um, fits into the movie format. It still fits, but they just miss some beats and some things that would add, in my opinion, a little bit more context. You know, s- you know, through the whole series, they were cutting stuff sp- specifically with the Dursleys. I understand it's um, it's pretty easy to cut them out because you can ignore them and have the the whole story still fit, but. When you're reading the books in comparison to the movies, you really do see how awful they are to Harry, and it really makes you hate them. And when you watch the when you watch the movies, you do get you you can sense it and understand it, but you don't grasp about just how awful they are. Um, this book does at least uh, the best job of the movies in portraying that, but. Um, but later on, it, it it definitely does struggle when they had to cut scenes specifically with the Dursleys to fit the movie format. Um, also, in this in this movie, they pretty much skip the whole month of August. It just it's it's weird and clunky. Harry's birthday is July thirty first, and they go shopping the next day, and then Harry boards the train the day after that, which magically jumps to September first. So it's. Something like that, had they put, you know, even in just a, you know, a 45 second, a minute thing, it wouldn't have added a whole lot to the runtime, but it would have just added a little bit more context. You could have added something about um, Uncle Vernon giving Harry Dudley's second bedroom, stuff like that. It just would have, it would have added a little bit more um, context to things. And I don't think it would have added to the overall length that much that, um, that people still wouldn't have sat through it. So, um, they also got Ravenclaw's sigil and house colors wrong. Um, again, this is to, to someone that has just only seen the movies and not read the books, they might not really care. But when you hear the description and, and see what the, the logo should actually be, it's kind of upsetting and I don't understand why they changed it. So, uh, ra- for those of you that don't know, the Ravenclaw sigil is an eagle, not a raven, and the colors are blue and bronze, not blue and silver like they are in the movie. Throughout the series, uh, they also diminish Ron's character by giving by giving many of his lines to Hermione. So Ron's character, especially earlier on, is used as an exposition character to give us insight into the r- wizarding world. And I think they give lots of Hermione's lines or Ron's lines to Hermione to make her seem smarter. Um, And, and it just doesn't work. It, it makes Ron useless in my opinion. And again, I'll probably talk about this in the, in the other movies as well, because when you do a side by side comparison of what Ron said in the books, and then you hear Hermione speak on screen, um, I don't know. It, Ron being useless, it just kind of diminishes his character, and I don't think it's necessary. Um, you could have matched up the books, and it still would have worked really well. One other thing, um, Voldemort being on the back of Quirrell's head doesn't hold up much after um, seeing Ralph Fiennes in the role. So I kind of wish that they would pull a George Lucas and re-edit that scene uh, just for some continuity. Uh, continuity sorry and um because ralph finds uh in that role is very very uh definitive he does a very good job and and the way that they're able to design the character it would fit so much better uh on the back of uh of Quirrell's head and even if you see some of the um, concept art for the movie they made it look a lot scarier which again I think would have worked a lot better if they would have used that but whoever they had as the actor for Voldemort uh, it just didn't fit and and if there's one thing that doesn't hold up in this movie it's that it just it doesn't look good why do I like the Philosopher's Stone I think the reason that I like this book to this day uh, is because it has a lot of nostalgia around it. Whenever I read the books or watch the movies, it feels like coming home. And the Philosopher's Stone, being the first, has such a familiarity to it um, and such almost an intrinsic value to me. It's the one that opened up the, the wizarding world. And when I was reading these books... I was the same age as Harry for the most part going through it all. I started reading the books when I was 11 
And having turned 17 a month before the release of the final book, The Deathly Hallows, um, I was just, I was I was just catching it at the right time in my life. Um, so when I reread specifically this one, it just takes me back to you know to that not a juvenile stage, but just like you know remembering when things were simple. And I think that's something that's largely ignored today. Everything's getting more complex, and you know like they say, adulting's hard. You know you get you started having kids, you get a job, all that stuff. It's sometimes really good to escape to things when, um, or to a time when things were simpler. And for me, that's kind of what Harry Potter does. Um, I'm sure many other people can kind of relate to that, or they had something going on in their life and, and it stands out with the times that they were reading these books. And that's kind of, um, that's kind of it for me. But I, like many other people, were just able to catch that wave at the right time you know, view Harry, Ron, and Hermione as friends. So when you read the book, it's like, you know, reliving old memories and and whatnot. Um, You know, I used to listen to Harry Potter podcasts. um, And uh, like way back in the day, like, um, you know, 2008, 2009, like way back before podcasts were really even a thing, um, you know, just to get get news about what was going on with the movies or even before the books came out, um, I was listening to them. So, um, but there's one particular that I, I um, used to listen to more recently and they would read fan mail about people's relationship with Harry Potter. And lots of the sentiments were true with me uh, when I would hear their stories about the series getting through hard times and whatnot. Um, and largely for me, the Philosopher's Stone, while it isn't my favorite book or movie, there is such familiarity with it when I read it or watch the movie. It just connects with me really well. I can turn on John Williams' score and listen to it in any situation, whether I'm working out at the gym, driving, at work. It can give me enjoyment. Um, I think that's one of the, the really cool things about, about music in particular. I think um, there's one scene in the movie that really stands out, specifically with the music, and uh, it's just done really well in the scene. Uh, it takes place after the Mirror of Air is set and uh, Dumbledore uh, confronts Harry. And there's a transition from winter to spring. And Harry is walking the grounds with Hedwig. And it's honestly a nothing scene. No words are spoken. It's just Harry and his owl. And it isn't in the books, but it's just a really good scene. And every time that I watch it, I remind myself of how good those 44, 45 seconds are. Um, I have it linked in the description box. Go check it out. Um, but you know, in this scene, you see parts of the castle and the Quidditch pitch and in rewatching it for this review, it really just took a place that, uh, that I wanted to be immersed in and it really makes it feel real. Um, I'm really excited for Hogwarts Legacy. It's a game that's, uh, coming out, uh, hopefully, uh, this year, hopefully it doesn't get delayed any longer. Um, cause I think it was announced back in like 2017. So it's been in production for a while and I hope it plays well, um, you know, I, I ragged pretty hard in some areas that I disliked um, just because I almost wanted more out of it. Uh, J.K. Rowling really didn't hit her stride until the fourth book. And lots of it's just to do with length. I think if this book and the second book were as long as the third book was, um, just to be able to flesh out a little bit more, some of my higher expectations or um, things that I was nitpicking probably could have been met and I think that would have ultimately um I think it ultimately would have set a more of a fluid um fluid read and overall structure um of the whole series and some of those things that maybe she would have had to shoehorn or there's lack of world building and stuff like that um those problems probably wouldn't have persisted um you know, if she was, if she was to have the first two books as long as the third, and there's truthfully not a huge difference between them, but those are, are are kind of a um, couple of things that probably could have just added a little bit more to the series. I think that's, uh, that's kind of it. That's probably a good place to stop. I think I've kind of summed up everything and and given, um, you know, my thoughts on it, on everything pertaining to the Philosopher's Stone. Um, I'm expecting that, you know, with the more detail and longer books and, and longer movies that I'll be able to, um, 
you know, have more things to say and, and can, and piggyback on lots of the things that I've already touched upon. Um, cause I, I know there will be nitpicks, um, that I saw in this book continue on through the others, but thank you so much for listening to this episode. Click that like button if you like Harry Potter and make sure to subscribe for more content like this. Uh, like I said, I'll be doing one of these episodes, uh, each month for this bit. Um, I have two planned for July. Um, just because I'm trying to fit everything in before the end of the new year and kind of time it when the supposed the release of Hogwarts Legacy is. So I kind of have it, it all planned out that way. Um, but it's honestly really nice to do these pop culture stuff just to break up lots of the political stuff that I end up talking about. Um, you know, there there is a whole lot going on right now. Um, but like I said just a little bit earlier, it is it is good to be able to have things like books and movies and other forms of entertainment to just kind of take a break from all of it and check out and, and enjoy, um, enjoy something that's not real life for just a little bit. Um, it's something that... It's something that's often overlooked because there, it life just gets in the way and there is so much busyness and, and all of that stuff. So... Um, I would, I'd really appreciate it. I'm like, like I said, I'm doing, I'm reading all of them and rewatching all of them. Um, you know, if you, uh, want to go back to Hogwarts, definitely, uh, click the, go into the description box and, um, you know, you have the audio books you can listen at work while you're on the road, whatever. Um, but let me know in the comments if I got something wrong about the book or movie, uh, if you disagree with my take or anything like that. But again, thank you so much for listening. Have a good one. You're a wizard, Harry. It does not do to dwell on dreams and forget to live. To the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. Stay free. Thank you for listening to the Schmidt House podcast. If you want to support the podcast, you can do so by sending Bitcoin. The wallet address is in the description box below. I would really appreciate it as I try to keep the podcast ad-free and it helps me cover production costs. The Schmidt House podcast is available on the following services, YouTube, Rumble, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Please like, share, and subscribe, and, en and enable notifications, but most importantly, share this podcast with a friend by copying the link and sending it to them personally. Check out the description box for more information about things I discussed on this episode and how to get in contact with me. Feel free to reach out to me with any questions or suggestions that you may have, including topics that you would like to hear me discuss. Take it easy and have a good day.